Good evening, everyone, and welcome. If you'll bear with us, as usual, just a minute or two while I let people continue to let people in. Okay, well, I make it exactly six o'clock. I suspect the rather nice sunny evening may be <laughs> deterring people from sitting by their computer, but uh, the event will be recorded, as you probably already know. Um, all right, let's, let's, let's make a start. Good. Okay, uh, so good evening, everyone. I do see some names that I'm not familiar with, which is always <laughs> gratifying. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Insiders Outsiders project, the rest of you will forgive me, I think, if I say a little bit about that by way of introduction. It was a year long nationwide arts festival that I myself initiated way back already a few years ago now, but it took place as a face to face festival, traversing sort of straddling all the arts um, from March 2019 to March 2020. And I think we all know what happened in the spring of 2020. And I'm eternally grateful that actually COVID did not really affect the uh, program too, too radically, too drastically. And like so many other people, we went online and this evening's event by Alexander Lazar is part of the ongoing program of mostly, not exclusively, but mostly online events on themes still relevant pertaining to that of the inside the original insiders outsiders festival namely the hugely diverse profound pervasive uh contribution of refugees from nazi europe and not just nazi germany but nazi europe nazi occupied europe dominated europe to british culture in all its manifold forms uh so it's my very great pleasure to have alexandra here talking about i think a uh, insufficiently well known, you know, he remains not as well known as he ought to be, figure from the world of architecture and town planning, namely Arthur Korn. And I will say, I don't think Alexandra will mind if I say so, that it's very much work in progress, it's ongoing research, and we're rather hoping that there is at least one person in the audience tonight who may indeed have something new to contribute to the discussion, so I await that with interest. Um, fine, so as I said, it's being recorded, so do make sure that everybody's muted, I think you all know the ropes. Equally, if you wish to um, uh, ask any questions, make any comments, then do uh, put, type them into the chat in the first instance. We'll have time for a Q&A uh, after Alexandra's had her uh, say. Um, good. So without further ado, let me say a few words by way of introduction about our speaker tonight. Uh, she's a London-based art, hist uh, art historian, a writer and curator. She read art history at the Courtauld Institute and also at Oxford Brookes University obtained an MA in Arts Criticism at the uh, at City University, and she has a BA in Graphic Art from the University of Applied Arts in Belgrade. Uh, she's currently the head of, uh, a curator of the Vina Art Collection. I don't know whether it'll be necessary or appropriate to say something about that, Alexandra, but also the founder and chair of the Association of Art Galleries, uh, Serbia. Alongside her curatorial practice, in her own words, she specialises in archival research into the influential role played by emigre artists and critics in British culture. So in other words, her interests dovetail absolutely with the overarching theme of the Insiders Outsiders project. And before I hand over to Alexandra, I should perhaps just say that both she and I are going to be taking part in an event at no lesser place than the Tate Archive at Tate Britain um, on the afternoon of the 16th of June it is, um, where she'll be talking about the immigrant art historian J.P. Hodin. So do check that out on the Tate's own website uh, or get in touch with us if, if you'd like to know more. So without further ado, Alexandra, I shall absent myself visually and uh, hand over with great pleasure to, to you. Thank you very much, Monica, and uh, thank thank you everybody <laughs> for sacrificing a lovely sunny afternoon, sunny evening to to, to join us to log in for tonight's talk uh, about the life and work of Arthur Kuhn, who was a German-born architect of the modern art movement who settled in the UK. Um, I will sort of okay share a screen. I think that's better to sort of yes. Is it, am I sharing, Monica? All good, perfect. All good, perfect. <laughs> yes. So uh, Arthur Korn, um, 
like for every emigre, his story seems to comprise of two distinct parts. The first follows his early practice of architecture, experiments of new materials and methods, membership in key avant-garde groups and involvement in town planning. And the second came after his internment in Britain, when his reformatory energies were drawn to Mars Group and later to teaching at the Architecture Association. What gave cohesion to his life's work was a set of ideas that directed his energies to machines for living, architecture for a modern society with a new structure of urbanism envisaged for an easy flux within communities, opening up traditional housing to a more integrated way of living. Although Kuhn was fortunate enough to escape Nazi Germany, his move to England in 1937 also signaled the end of his career as an architect, in a sense, with the result that he is now chiefly remembered as a pedagogue and a town planner. Kuhn's ideological background, he was a committed socialist and a Marxist, was not welcome in England. It prolonged his internment at Hutchinson Camp on the Isle of Man, severed some professional connections and friendships, and arguably affected his overall professional involvement, both as a town planner and practicing architect, and as theorist and member of Mars, CM, Riba, and other professional organizations, if he was a member, of which he became an increasingly withdrawn member. Yet, Kuhn's commitment to architecture and urban planning, as closely linked to ethical, environmental, and political issues, seems more relevant today than ever. So it is clearly a good time to reassess his life and work and to take stock of his significance. Arthur Kuhn was born in Breslau, Lower Silesia, in Germany, now Wroclaw, Poland, on 4th of June 1891, as the youngest of three children of Moritz Korn and Martha, née Epstein. Arthur had two sisters, Irma and Frieda. According to chronology in his 1967 uh, Festschrift, his father was a merchant dealing in machinery, whose family originated from Ostrowo, near the Prussian province of Posen, where Arthur's grandfather Zacharias Korn was born. Ostrowo was then a small town with a two-class elementary school since 1835. There was also a religious school, the beginnings of which date back to 1760s. The wooden synagogue, built in 1724, was rebuilt in 1860. Around 1900s, the synagogue building, flanked by two domed towers that you can see now, has been completely renovated. So here we see the synagogue on the postcard from around 1900s, and this would be the time when Korn's family would have lived there. Zacharias Korn, Arthur's grandfather, had three sons and a daughter, Albert, Moritz, Fabian and Pauline. Moritz was Arthur Korn's father. We will hopefully later hear uh, a few words from Daniel Kuhn, who got in touch um, a few months ago. Actually, he got in touch with me after, after the publication of the text on Daniel uh, Arthur Kuhn online. And recently he wrote to say that he's researched the family tree. Um, he is the descendant of Moritz's brother, Albert Kuhn, and he was kind enough to lend me this family tree. Courtesy of Daniel, we now know that there may be a family connection with the scientist Arthur Kuhn, who was a physicist, mathematician and inventor who experimented with long distance photography, the photo te uh, teleautograph. He was also from Breslau. Kuhn, the scientist, was involved in development of the fax machine, specifically the transmission of photographs known as build telegraph. He also worked on potential theory and the mathematics of physics and lectured in Charlottenburg at around the same time when other family members also lived in Berlin. So quite an interesting and creative family. This um, is a, hold on. <laughs> this is a photograph of Heinrich Korn, Daniel's great grandfather, who was Albert's son and Arthur Korn's first cousin. There is also a family note that Arthur's sister Frieda may have been a secretary to Rosa Luxemburg at one point. Now, whether this was true or was she perhaps mixed up with Frieda Stube or Luxemburg's comrade and confidant Matilda Jacob, we do not know. But what is notable is that both Arthur and his sister Irma, Arthur's cousin Heinrich and his son Hans, all emigrated to the UK in 1930s and have helped each other in the process the account of which exists in the correspondence and the extracts of the memoirs of Dr. Heinrich Korn, dated 1939, and assembled and translated from German in 2006 by Daniel's cousin, Christa Maria Roma. If he manages to join us later, I'm sure Daniel will be able to read us a few excerpts from these fascinating memoirs. According to Heinrich, 
Arthur's first cousin. His uncle Moritz married Martha Epstein from Breslau, and the couple moved first to Breslau, where Arthur was born, and then to Berlin. After the death of his wife, Opa Zaharias also moved to Berlin, as did Albert Korn around 1895. Brothers Moritz and Albert shared a house at Alexanderstrasse 24, where they developed a business. First, they started trading in scrap metal, then brickwork. Um, and then they became quite successful in supplying the watertight bricks for the Berlin sewers. For anybody knowing the uh, construction, well, the, the land in Berlin is, is um, marsh and the, the, the sewers had to be create, uh, constructed from particular type of brick. So they were apparently quite successful in this business, pr providing these watertight bricks. Between 1908 and 1909, Arthur studied at Luisenstadisches Gymnasium in Berlin, a carpentry trade school, and between 1909 and 1911, he attended the Royal College of Arts and Crafts in Berlin. At the beginning of 1911, he started his practice as an architectural assistant in Halle and Berlin. During 1914, while briefly working in the Office of Urban Planning of Greater Berlin, he came under the influence of Raymond Unwin's recently translated Town Planning in Practice. Uh, published in 1909. Now, Sir Raymond Unwin was a prominent and influential English engineer, architect and town planner with an em emphasis on improvements in working class housing. This interested young Arthur a great deal. Unwin was a technical advisor to the Greater London Regional Planning Committee in 1929. And it is likely that his two reports published in 1929 and 1933 influenced subsequent plan for Berlin from 1934. Korn's plans obviously never took hold, but we do know that early seeds from Unwin took hold. In July 1914, Korn volunteered for the 5th Grenadier Guards Regiment. Decorated with the Iron Cross, he returned to Berlin in 1918. A year later, the architect Erich Mendelssohn invited him to become his partner. Together, they designed a 42-unit housing development in Luckenwalde, near Berlin. However, the partnership ended after only six months, allegedly due to clash of personalities. Following a short spell of shop designs, in 1922, Korn started the most successful partnership of his life. He entered a working partnership with Sigrid Weizmann. Korn had a creative vision. Weizmann was in charge of structural engineering, finances, and construction. And the eight years that they worked together was the pinnacle of both their careers. Although nearly all the buildings that Korn and Weizmann constructed have been destroyed, there is ample evidence to suggest that their work was influential. They had important and visible commissions. Walter Gropius included photographs of their work in his Bauhaus book number one on international architecture, and Hans Polzig, German architect, painter, and set designer, proclaimed them the most interesting young modern architects. Korn's Manifesto, Analytical and Utopian Architecture, published in a post-expressionist magazine, Des Kunstblatt, in 1923, states, rather excitedly, architecture is symbol, radiation, tendency of order, music, or an impetus to the end, embracing and dissolution. The building is no longer a block, but a dissolution into cells, a crystallization from point to point. Architecture is passionate love. But then he goes on to say, but it is only possible to live in a functional house if the symbolic art form back to practical demands, feeling the organism and asking on which columns and shells the buildings is supported. How does color keep stationary or appear to move? How does the building connect with the immediate and wider surroundings of the atmosphere? How do the individual rooms ask collectively? How does the whole relate to the smallest particle and how does the whole grow into a cell of a community? How does a whole grow into a symbol of the landscape and into a human image? So here we can see a spirited young man deeply passionate about his subject but already fully invested in integrating architecture in the community and the surrounding landscape. Projects by the Korn and Weizmann partnership included several shops, among which were three stores for Kopp and, and Josef in Berlin's Kurfustendam, Tauenzierstrasse and Potsdamer Straße between 1922 and 1930, and also Verlag Ulstein, 
built in 1925. Um, according to the scholars Götz Ali and Michel Sondheimer, they were fortunate to get commissions from the middle class Jewish clients. Um, and I'll quote the uh, Ali and Michel Sondheimer. This is a very interesting passage from their book. They were saying, since the clients were not steeped in Christian German traditions, they were able to understand and embrace modern architecture as an expression of social and technical progress. We had a relatively free hand in creating our designs, said Korn. We experimented like crazy and were profoundly influenced by the experiments of others. He considered himself an exponent of new objectivity, which he described as an attempt to establish boundless beauty in ordinary objects in an appropriate art form. In doing so, he sought to consecrate ordinary life and produce architecture that was as highly disciplined as it was adaptable to circumstances. Whatever the political and aesthetic differences, Korn wrote, the members of this group considered themselves part of a unified force. The standout among the private commissions of this period was the beautiful Villa Goldstein in Grunewald in Arisale, built in 1922. This incredible 50-room villa was the pinnacle of modernity. Uh, it had a swimming pool built by Richard Neutra, an architect, and also a peculiar detail, a mobile water machine by the sculptor Rudolf Belling. You can see it here in a photograph on the left. Um, Korn's assistant, Rudolf Steiger, um, his Swiss assistant that he worked with later, he remembers working on this project and how this water machine consisted of a group of long and short spirals arranged transversely and moved by small water wheels that turned at different speeds, creating a dynamic movement. Steiger believes this to be one of the earliest abstract mobiles to be developed by other sculptors in subsequent years. This was 1922, so fairly early. On the weekends, the villa drew apparently crowds of strollers and architecture admirers who would come and walk by and discuss its unusual aesthetics. Of course, Korn was aware at the time of the work of the Russian artists and the early kinetic sculptors by Alexander Rodchenko, Naum Gabo and Vladimir Tatlin, whose kinetic works precede those by Alexander Kalder. He did reference the 1927 set design for the Ballet Le Chat by Jagilev, um, created by the brothers Antoine Pevsner and Noam Gabo in his 1929 book, Glass in Architecture and Decoration. So this is a photograph that Korn um, reproduced in his book in 1929. And this is the same set design that was reproduced, a photograph by Manuel Flores and featured in the book, The Russian Ballet uh, by Walter Archibald po Propert and published in New York in 1932. Following this large commission, Korn and Weizmann were invited to create their magnum opus. This was from rubber factory, built in 1928 till 1930 on the 170,000 square feet real estate of Julius Fromm at Friedrichshanger Straße in uh, the Kopernik district of Berlin. The factory had three-story administration building in bright red steel, a covered walkway 475 feet long and 13 feet wide opening on the estate on connecting the offices with three production halls forming the backbone of the whole plant. I think you can see at the bottom here the, um, the plan, but we also have it here. So the lower part is that glass covered corridor that connected all the buildings. Office, um, office is the building number one to the right. Number two is the canteen and the service building. Three are the halls and four is the power plant. According to Ali and Sondheimer, most of the workrooms had full length glass facades and glass walls separating the individual rooms created a sense of airiness. In 1931, the architectural magazine Bauwelt featured a story about the plant as a prototype of the modern factory. And they wrote, the design heavily emphasizes objectivity and the construction makes ample use of the architect's materials of choice, steel, concrete and glass. The administration building and the production halls were equipped with a climate control system, 
which was then called a ventilation system that kept the humidity and the temperature of the rooms at a constant level in summer and winter. The building incorporated the working hypothesis that Ludwig Mies van der Rohe had set forth in 1923. The office building is a place of work, of organization, of clarity and of economy. Maximal effect with minimal expenditure of means. The materials are concrete, iron, glass. Reinforced concrete buildings are by nature skeletal buildings. No gingerbread or tourettes. Load bearing girder construction and non bearing walls. This is skin and bones construction. This and other excerpts from Ali and Sonheimer come from their 2009 book titled Fromm's How Julius Fromm's Condom Empire Fell to the Nazis. I discovered a book while researching the, um, the buildings built by, um, by Korn and Weizmann. And um, it is a fascinating story about Julius Fromm, a Polish German entrepreneur, the owner of the factory, who was a chemist and one of the inventors of the rubber condom, as well as other elastometric products, such as rubber gloves and hot water bottles. He built his business from the ground up, opening branches in Denmark, United Kingdom, Poland, and the Netherlands, only to see it all seized by the Nazis. His factory was destroyed by the Allied bombing and the machinery shipped to the Soviet Union, and the company assets were later nationalized. He died in relative poverty in Britain. But in 1928, at the time the factories were built, the, these factories were breakthrough of engineering in more ways than one. At the time Korn and Weizmann started planning, Arthur Korn was working on his blue book, Glass in Architecture and Decoration. Up until that point in time, glass had been considered a secondary material, but Korn was of the opinion that an independent skin of glass could be made, opening up the view to the interior. The space is in depth and the structural frame that delineates them. The distinction between wall and window would dissolve since, he said, the wall in this is this window itself, or in other words, this wall is itself the window. This dissolution of the exterior boundary and of building is mirrored in an interior innovation. The, uh, Korn wrote, the interior dividing walls are reduced to glass walls and configured in many different forms. These were some of the aspects of the building. You can see how most of the outside, well, it doesn't seem so incredibly groundbreaking from a perspective of 20, 100 years later, but this was, this was a, a technical masterpiece. And um, Korn's book, Glass in Architecture and Decoration, came out in 2009 as a very lavishly illustrated publication with photographs of many uses of glass supporting Korn's theories. Raymond McGrath, later on in his essay in 1965 um, for planning and architecture, essays presented to Arthur Korn by the Architectural Association, calls it a prophetic book whose chief importance lies in its 187 illustrations and the author's visionary belief in its visual and structural importance. It gives an overview of architectural use of glass from Miss van der Rohe's skyscrapers in, built from 1919, 1920, Brinkman and van, van der Vlucht van Nele factory, freshly built in Rotterdam, just built in 1925, Le Corbusier's house in Ote and other European examples. This comes at a time when practical development of glass and concrete construction are still very much in development. The Kepler system, patented by Friedrich Kepler in 1907, was still improved at the time when Korn wrote this book and indeed put its, um, its system in practice. There were sections of the book that dealt with mosaic and glass painting and they were illustrated by Josef Albers and glass in three-dimensional setting was illustrated by the aforementioned stage set by Gabo and Pevsner. With evident pride, Julius Fromm guided his guests and architectural enthusiasts through his factory, which was unique and constructed according to the principles of functionality and a healthy work environment, an abundance of light that would suffuse the production and administration wings, making it possible, as Julius Fromm was convinced, to fill the factory and office workers with pleasure in carrying out their duties. The aesthetically ambitious functionality and the minimalism of the surrounding outer shell, which Korn called barely perceptible, was, as Ali and Sontheimer noted, a fitting counterpart to the main product manufacturer at the Fromm factory. 
to keep the boundary between inside and outside to an absolute minimum, a from condom could not weigh more than 0.053 ounces. As a result, a very thin skin was fashioned, so translucent that the protective material was, quote, barely perceptible to the naked eye, end quote. Korn's book described his architecture in similar terms. The disappearance of the outside wall and the use of glass yielded a great membrane full of mystery, delicate yet tough, heightening the effect through the occasional glimpses of the load-bearing supports in its interior. This, this quote comes from, from the Ally and, um, and Sondheimer book, which I found really fascinating. Photographs of Korn and Weizmann's Villa Goldstein in Berlin were published in Walter Gropius' seminal visual anthology of the new architecture, Inter Internationale Architektur, in 1925 and Korn's business center for Haifa in Jerusalem that won sect prize in the competition the previous year was included by Gropius in a volume one of the Bauhaus books. Other examples in the book included projects by Gropius, Hans Polzing, Peter Behrens, Brothers Luckhardt, Mies van der Rohe, Mendelssohn, Henry van der Velde from Holland, Frank Lloyd Wright from USA, Jaroslav Fragner in, from Prague, Ginsburg and Vladimira from Russia, and such iconic buildings as a Fiat factory and tra racing track in Torino, the Orly Airport in Paris, the Moscow Market, Chicago Tribune building, and so on. So Korn was in a really good company. During the 1920s, Korn was associated with various architectural groups, such as November and the Ring, until both groups were forced to dissolve in the arrival of Nazism. The November group was formed in 1918 with members of Bauhaus from all artistic activities, with Hindemith, Picabia, Leger, Ruthman and Egeling among its ranks. Korn was the secretary of the group from 1924 onwards. The Ring was formed in 1926 and its members were just young architects who were looking to promote expressionist, modernist architecture against the prevailing historicism. The group was founded by Hugo Hering and Mies van der Rohe and represented the German, German avant-garde at, um, at the foundation meeting of CIEM, the International Congress of Modern Architecture, in 1928 in La Serraz. In spite of his commissions during the 20s, Korn's true interest was in socialist town planning. This was furthered by his trip to the USSR in 1929, when he met Soviet modernist architects and planners. The same year, he also co-founded the Collective for Socialist Building in Berlin and made proposals for the future development of the city in his Plan for Berlin, which he developed from 1925 to 1934. Korn's fascination with socialist planning was in no way unusual at the time. This was a period when many modernist architects turned toward the Soviet Union for inspiration and its ambitious large-scale projects, following the disillusionment with capitalism and the great crisis of the 1929. This was the time when Le Corbusier creates his proposal for Central Soyuz building in the Palace of the Soviets. The historian Ross Wolf writes eloquently about this time in history. And I quote, um, the Soviet Union alone had presented the modernists with the conditions necessary to realize their original vision. Only it possesses the centralized state planning organs that could implement building on such a vast scale. Only it promised to overcome the clash of personal interests entailed by the sacred cow of private property. And only it had the sheer expanse of land necessary to approximate the spatial infinity required by the modernist's international imagination. The defeat of architectural modernism in Russia left the country a virtual graveyard of the utopian visions of unbuilt worlds that had once been built upon. It is only after one grasps the magnitude of the avant-garde sense of loss in this theater of the world's history that all the subsequent developments of modernist architecture in the 20th century become intelligible. For here it becomes clear how an architect like Mies van der Rohe, who early in his career designed the monument to the communist heroes Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg in 1926, would later be the man, man responsible for one of the swankiest monuments of the high Fordist capitalism, the Seagram building of 1958. 
And here one can see how Le Corbusier, embittered by the Soviet experience, would go on to co-design the United Nations building in New York after briefly flirting with Vichy fascism during the war." End quote. Sadly, Korn's visionary work was not to continue. In 1934, after Hitler, Hitler's accession to power and the incorporation of the Bund Deutsche Architekten in the Reichskulturkammer, Korn was, among others, forbidden to practice architecture in Germany. Um, the same year, he went to sorry, he went to London with Walter Gropius as a member of the German delegation to the International Congress of Modern Architecture, CM. This was a year after the legendary CM conference of 1933 in Athens, the functional city, when its members drafted the Athens Charter, an urban planning charter that would be used as a springboard for all future urban development. The Athens Charter, drafted and reviewed by Le Corbusier, Van Eesteren, Josef Louis Sert, Karl Moser, Ruch Tiger, Roman Piotrowski, Pierre Bottoni, Helena Sirkis, and Wells Coates, among others, contained 95 resolutions based on the analysis of 33 cities and a synthesis of studies about the individual and the collective. In many ways, the CM Manifesto, the Athens Charter, intended to advance the cause of architecture as a social art. And as such, it will become the single most influential document that formalized the principles of the modern movement to affect urban planning after the war. A line from its resolution number two reads, life flourishes only to the extent of accord between the two contradictory principles that govern the human personality, the individual and the collective. CM meeting introduced both Korn and Gropius to the Mars group, Mars, or Modern Architectural Research Group, was founded in 1933 when Sigrid Gideon of CM asked Morton Shand to form a British division of the group. Korn joined Mars soon afterwards and remained its member until its dissolution in 1957. However, in 1934, following the events in Germany, Walter Gropius stayed in England and began his partnership with Maxwell Fry. Gropius, um, while well, Gropius stayed, um, sorry, while well, Korn emigrated to Yugoslavia, where he worked as an independent architect and planner in Zagreb between 1935 and 1937. According to the brief note in his biographical summary, Korn worked on three major interior decoration schemes, a town planning competition for Zagreb with Vladimir Antolic, and a project for three textile factories in Zagreb. But very little is known about um, these buildings. Ten years ago, when I was uh, working on beginnings of this research with uh, Sandra krizic Robin from the Institute um, of Contemporary Art in Zagreb, we both tried to um, track down um, at least some information about these works, but we were, we were not successful. Um, after his spell in Zagreb, Korn returned to England in 1937, having secured the reference letters to support him. The letters here are from Walter Gropius, by then already in Harvard, and Maxwell Fry. Gropius, in particular, was generous and highlighted that Korn belonged to the executive, uh, executive committee of the Congress Internationale uh, de l'Architecture Moderne in Zurich, and wrote, in recent years, he was particularly concerned with town planning problems, and he is an excellent expert also in this field. Once in England, Korn worked with FRS York and with Maxwell Fry and participated at the Marx Group exhibition at the New Burlington Galleries in 1938. However, as Walter Bohr highlights, there was a mounting disappointment at the seemingly interminable repetition of the same rows of mean little two-story terrace houses, and there was a cold shoulder from some fellow emigres. Gropius allegedly did not like working with foreigners in his office and did not lightly employ or support them, remembers Bohr. There was a palpable arrogance in the Bartlett School of Architecture's recognition of modernism. Albert Richardson, the advocate of neo-Georgian tradition, insisted on forgetting all that Bauhaus nonsense. Richardson allegedly hated Le Corbusier, forbidding the mention of his name. Korn's contemporary and colleague Edward Carter says of this period, 
Fry was building Sassoon House and Sun House was starting. Mendelssohn and Chenraev were building the Bexhill Pavilion. Texton had become, been going for several years. The Gorilla House and the Penguin Pool had been built and High Point was building. Wells Coates was building Lawn Road Flats and Gibbard, with whom Corn stayed during 1934 visit, was building Pullman Court. There were still four years to go before the Burlington Galleries exhibition was to put a total argument of modern architecture before the uninterested British public. At this time, the modern architectural uh, achievement in Britain was exemplified by some 20 scattered buildings. But Mars was at its high point of its energies as a research and propagandist body and ready for the contributions that Gropius, Breuer, Mendelssohn and soon Arthur Korn would make. Although Siem had concerned itself from the start with the widest social and urban planning implications of modern architecture, we had to wait until Arthur Korn returned in 1937 for his influence to translate Siem and Mars ideas into the actual actuality of greater London planning. The climate for CM and Mars architects in England was chilly and its legitimacy needed time to establish. When CM sent a letter to Howard Robinson, inviting him to attend the meeting in October 1929 and to organize the English branch of architects, he replied with great suspicion. In the first place, he wrote, we have not here a modern movement similar to that in Europe. The average English view to what is modern in the form of housing does not, I think, correspond with that abroad. There are, for example, no housing schemes of the type which I have seen in Germany and elsewhere. As regards an exhibition, it is quite impossible to prepare this at such short notice. In the first place, there had recently been an exhibition for which many architects have loaned photographs, and in the second place, English architects are not very interested in sending their work abroad. For the moment, your Congress is not sufficiently well known in England to raise much enthusiasm as regard an exhibition, and I personally have not the time to attempt the organization, even a small one. Even members of Mars struggled with the context they were placed in, and this continued after the war. In his 1967 essay, Edward Carter, one of the members, remembers, we describe ourselves as modern architects and may wake up to find that we have not got a modern world, but that merely the architecture has decayed or that it has even the architecture of the past decade that we have been talking about. At Mars group meetings, architects are grappling over the use of term modern versus emergent or contemporary in attempts to accurately describe their work in relation to the context of post-war Britain. In this environment, Korn's strong socialist leanings did not endear him to his peers. Maxwell Fry, in particular, was wary of his vehement Marxism, as he called it, and had own reasons for wanting him out of the picture. He was happy to recommend him as a teacher, but not as a town planner in the UK. My experience in the Reba Council, he wrote, told me that subversive politics and architecture made poor bedfellows, and Korn was a good architect. Then, as I listened, and at times impatiently, to the laborious dialectic, inescapable proof of his assertions, I came upon a delicacy of mind and a quite separate critical apparatus that owed more to artistic enthusiasm and a warm heart than to any system of reasoning. And at this point, we became friends. This he wrote um, as part of the obituary to Arthur Korn, so he softened, but only just very little. In 1939, Korn was interned at the Hutchinson camp for 18 months under the Aliens Restriction Act of 1914 and the Aliens Order of 1920. Edward Carter notes that his political affiliation might have contributed to his longer detention at the camp. His past, especially his socialist ideals, appreciation of the Soviet architecture and the founding of the Collective for so Socialist Building in Berlin were bad marks on his record and red flags for the British intelligence. Although all his colleagues appealed for Korn's release, he remained at Hanschitzon for 18 months. Upon his release, securing any kind of employment or reference had been difficult. However, other members of Mars and old members of the Ring were much more active at the time. 
During this same period, Walter Gropius and Maxwell Fry built a house on 66 Old Church Street in Chelsea for Ben Levy, whereas Erno Goldfinger built 1, 2 and 3 Willow Road, Hampstead, where he lived with his artist wife, Ursula Blackwell, as well as the Trellick Tower, the Balfron Tower, to Willow Road, Metro Central Heights and the Glencary House. Although considered influential as a teacher, Korn was fast disappearing as a practitioner. His town planning concepts have also proven divisive. Shortly before his internment, Korn was the chairman of the Mars Town Planning Subcommittee, where he put to practice his experience from the planning scheme for Berlin into a comprehensive planning scheme for London. The committee, set up in December 1937, comprised of Maxwell Fry, Godfrey Samuel, Tatum Brown, Arthur Ling and Christopher Tunnard, with Arthur Korn in the chair and Felix Samueli running a subcommittee on transport and economics. The Mars Group's plans for London were a product of close and long-standing collaboration. Korn was described as having been the mainspring of the enterprise and as providing an infectious enthusiasm that drove the project forward. However, interrupted by his internment, his enterpri the enterprise fizzled out. On his release in 1941, work recommenced, but not as cohesively as before. Korn continued working with Felix Samueli and Maxwell Fry, who was then the secretary of the group, and Arthur Ling. Together they organized an exhibition of the plan and published a description and analysis under the joint authorship of Arthur Korn and Felix Samueli at the Architectural Association Journal in 1942. So this is the plan that they published in 42. The Mars Group's replanning schemes envisioned London future in 16 long residential strips running perpendicular to the River Thames, looking a little like a giant bacteria. The Mars plan was a decentralized linear city reminiscent of the work of the Soviet urbanists of the late 1920s. To Korn and Samueli, writes Ian Mansfield, London was an enormous, enormous body with little underlying social cohesion and in need of radical rebuilding. Their plan included a vertebra of the herringbone that comp comprised the areas of administrative and commercial buildings with the docks and industries at its ends. The bones are the residential areas with the local industries at their ends. Between the residential strips are parks and recreation grounds where the schools and playing fields were to be located. All parts of the city would have been connected by railway whose stations were to be within walking distance even from the remote parts of the residential area. The long distance railways were then to be reconnected by means of belt which forms a traffic ring to the north and south meeting in a central line where the main passenger stations are located. The Mars plan caused an outcry among the readers, as well as fellow Mars group members. The plan was described by Lionel Brett as a futurist fantasy. Some others went as far as to call it bonkers. Yet two years later, Edwin Maxwell Fry published a seemingly very similar plan for London in his book, Fine Building. With this plan, according to the Swiss architect and researcher, Miriam Kupferschmidt, Fry disassociates himself entirely from the group and takes all the credit for the work on the plan. At first sight, the plan looks like a color version of the 1942 publication, but on closer inspection, it becomes obvious that his style resembles the pre-war proposal, matching it exactly in some parts. However, all this became nil and void because by this time, Abercrombie County of London plan came out and overshadowed all attempts to modernize London. It became a blueprint for rebuilding not just London, but other bombed cities. The rejection of Mars plan signaled the end of activities of the group, who then dismantled in 1957. However, Arthur Korn didn't quite give up on town planning. In 1953, the overview of his town planning ideas came out as a volume, History Builds Town. In 1958, Already a lecturer at the AA, he entered the competition for rebuilding central area of Berlin, along with his students, Stephen Rosenberg, Hausden, Flower and Smith. Their proposal, 
on view at the AA archive, consists of three sheets of isometric view showing the central portion of the promenade. The design for Berlin consists of three long blocks of high-rise buildings and flyovers. With an international jury, architects from nine countries were invited to participate, including Hans Scharon, Le Corbusier, and Matt Stamm. The East Berlin authorities were not consulted in the competition conditions and therefore were not keen on promoting the project. 150 entries were received, with 10 entries submitted from Great Britain, but the largest entry was from Germany. This was a little bit like Eurovision. There were 10 successful competitions. Competitors, the first five projects, went to German, German practices. Spengelin, Egling and Pampel, Pampelfort were the winners of the first prize. The design by Arthur Korn, Stephen Rosenberg, with House and Flower and Smith, was unplaced. The project could not be built due to economic and political climate. Korn began his teaching at the Oxford School of Architecture in 1941, and in 1945 he joined the faculty of the Architectural Association School of Architecture in London. His enthusiasm and teaching methods brought out many talented students who often spoke fondly of him. One of his former students, Leslie Ginsburg, says, always at the end of the day, he insisted it was our duty to aim high, to design only for the best, and to move the economic and political constraints so we could achieve what was needed. Another student, Stephen Rosenberg, confirms this. A student of his will produce a good design under the impression that he alone has produced it, not realizing it was Korn who, without pushing any ideas, has prodded him into it. But his infectious enthusiasm, he has managed to bring out much latent talent in outwardly unpromising material. Architect Dennis Sharp was also one of his students, as his wife and associate Yasmin Sharif remembers. Whenever Dennis spoke of his time as a student at the AA, the enigmatic tutor Arthur Korn would inevitably be mentioned. Korn's commitment, his uh, assonate optimism and belief in man, architecture and planning as the most powerful instruments in making the world a better place was shared by his enthusiastic students. In the years that followed, his former colleague and new objectivity architect, Max Taut, arranged for the architecture department of the Berlin Academy of Arts to have Korn named as its special member. Korn accepted the honor with great pleasure. After retiring in 1966, he moved to Austria where he died in 1978. Arthur Korn appears unprepared for the social shift he encountered in Britain. Unlike his peers, he has not reversed his politics nor capitalized on his early successes. His modernist ideals did not end with singular brutalist buildings. As a town planner, he envisaged a future of living that would enable easy flux within communities, open up the recalcitrant structures that were guarding access. Korn believed that by rejecting the anachronisms of the past, the city could be free to choose its future. Would it have been a different future if his ideas for mass group were upheld? Perhaps the Cold War climate was not conductive to the experimental practices of his youth. Perhaps Bauhaus has been accepted as an anomaly disassociated from the mainstream culture in Britain, suitable only if declawed from its socialist and egalitarian ideas. Perhaps, like Bertolt Lubetkin, Korn also felt that the parasitic growth has fastened on the early dreams of pioneers. Lubetkin wrote, the purveyors of frissons a la mode have only succeeded in debasing and eroding those original aspirations, substituting the flicker of change for progress. Perhaps he felt the same, but this we do not know. What we do know is that Korn's teaching was fruitful and much admired. His planning ideas were in need of expanding in practice. Perhaps he was content in his role as a pedagogue, where he made students see with new eyes, according to Ginsburg. Or perhaps he could have given chance pioneered some welcome changes to the urban planning in post-war England. 
As a way of conclusion, it may be of interest to reflect on ideas of a contemporary artist, Yasmina Tsibic, whose work in a tradition of Gesamkun's work is based on archival research of the 20th century socialist modernism, its thematic and formal traces and their instrumentalization by various political entities. In her most recent film, The Gift from 2021, she calls it here COVID baby, uh, the film that's shown several days ago at the Barbican, Siebich uses avant-garde art and architecture as cultural agents that question what constitutes a gift to a city or a society. Korn and his fellow modernists acted from the idea of creating a new architectural vocabulary in order to materialize, materialize a new way of living. Siebich uses the iconic European buildings, each conceived as a gift to the nation by its donor, addressing cultural's role as a Trojan horse for political interests. The film features Niemeyer's French Communist Party headquarters in Paris, the Palais, of Nation, the Palais of Nations in Geneva, the Palace of Culture and Science in Warsaw and Mount Bolduja in Bulgaria, and uses classical dramatic elements, monumental settings, allegoric dialogue conveying syncretism of multiple versions of archival narratives, the duality between the natural laws and social action, mystery and metamorphosis. The buildings in her film, alive as allegories, serve to evoke the temples of labor and worship, creation and demise. The gift treats the past in relation to memory rather than history, revealing and simultaneously disguising its own philosophical message. While the legacy of the Bauhaus includes the dissemination of a modern architectural style globally, Siebich looks at the dissemination of political ideas and sconced within the gift of modernity, Zibich, a contemporary, speaks of a general civilizational crisis. But have we not been there before? Is there not a way to re-engage the battle between the machine man and the analytical artist, between the collective and the individual, as envisioned by Korn and others? To look how modernity sought meaning, not only in abstract utopian sense, but as heightened awareness of the subject and their direct relationship with their surroundings. Points of connection, isn't that the message for today's world? Oops. Thank you so very much, Alexandra. I'm sure that everybody will agree with me when I say that was hugely interesting and, and thought provoking, also beautifully structured and shaped as a, as a talk. So thank you very much indeed. Now, I think I'm right in saying I was sort of just checking <laughs> those coming in slightly late that we do indeed have Daniel Korn in the audience. Uh, Daniel, am I right? I assume that Daniel is indeed Daniel Korn. If, you, if that's correct, would you like to unmute Hello. yourself? Hello. Hi, oh, fantastic. And do put do put your camera on, Daniel. I'm and welcome, of course. Finish. Welcome. Let me let me what yeah. like you. <coughs> Hi, Daniel. All right. Sorry, I'm not very well organized. Um see so you're not working. Um, I think you have to put your camera on before I can, in fact, spotlight you. Um, let's see what's yes, happening. I was on Skype, yeah. There it should work now. Um, Is that working? Allowed nope. to multi Not yet. Um, hold I'll on. turn it on and off again. Oh, actually, no. There we go. Right, where, yeah. where are we? Uh, Daniel, you got me now. Very good. Now yeah. I can do it. Excellent. Welcome. Yes. I'm so glad Hello. you could join us. So I think, as you know, as Alexandra said, we would welcome any more personal, perhaps, comments you might have, insights into well, the yeah, I mean, background. I think I only caught a little bit at the beginning. I'm sorry, I've only caught a little bit. So I have to see the recording, I think. Um, listen to the recording um but um yeah i mean there, there was some extracts from there some material as i was explaining it's really it was, it was doing some genealogical research and i came across this article of um, alexandra's <clears throat> and that's how it sort of drew, drew me into it a little bit and as part of that um i mentioned to alexandra that my um my great grandfather would have been um arthur Cohen's first cousin mm -hmm. had written a sort of um um, an account, a sort of biographical account of his, um, I mean, it wasn't, it's not great literature, but it's, it's, it's quite interesting about his time in Germany, sort of um, prior to, he did eventually emigrate to England in um, 1939, I think. Um, <clears throat> and um, yeah, so so there's a few sort of oblique references to, to Arthur Korn there, not very much really, but more his first 
doctor, I think his uncle Moritz would have been Arthur Korn's father, his paternal uncle. So he's mentioned quite a bit and, and um, Moritz's um, wife, Arthur Korn's mother, Martha. And I think they had a, they had a bit of an association. I, could, I did put it in a letter to, to Alexandra and I can um, see, I could perhaps read a bit of that letter. Yes, with great, with great I had gleaned, I had gleaned from the... Um, <clears throat> from the, uh, the, the, the account. Um, yeah, so I said, essentially, I believe Arthur Korn was my great, great grandfather's. His name is Heinrich Korn, first cousin. I think he showed a photo earlier of him in his youth. Um, and he was my, his father was my, yeah. So, um, so Arthur Korn was Albert Korn, my great grand, my great, great, that would be my great, great grandfather's um, nephew. Um, Moritz married Martha Epstein. They had, they had two girls and a boy. I don't know if they had other children, but that's all I'm aware of. I know they may have been, there's Frieda, Irma. Irma um, also emigrated to the UK, Irma Korn, Arthur Korn's sister. Um, but I, there was a mention of Frieda and there is something written in the family tree I have been, some association of Rosa Luxemburg, but I'm not quite sure what that was. Um, <clears throat> so I was saying from the account that Albert, my great grandfather, and his um, brother Moritz, who was Arthur's, Arthur's um, father, seemed quite different characters. In fact, um, Albert, my great grandfather, became a physician, and his, his son did as well, and also my father. Um, so there seemed to be a medical uh, theme in that side of the family, different to the sort of architecture. Um, so Moritz Korn being described as, in, in the account, he's described his uh, Arthur Korn's father as a restless one of the family and a good natured man, but a dreamer in business, as in other fears of life, spheres of life. So he never really achieved anything. So I don't know if that, the sort of, there may be an association there between Arthur Korn and his father, and that his father was a sort of, somebody who had sort of aspirations and dreams and, you know, Arthur Korn was perhaps somebody who tried to put those into practice. Whereas his brother, Albert Korn, who was my great, Great grandfather was seen as more kind of strict and orderly and, and less less of a dreamer about the sound of things. Um, so yeah, so he says Arthur Morris Corn, he was the youngest child of, of his father was the youngest child of his family. They also had um there was another brother, Fabian, and a sister Pauline, who went to America. Um, the relationship seemed quite quite close between my great grandfather, no. I'm getting confused now, just a minute. Yeah, I think it might be my great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, which would have been Heinrich Korn's father, Albert, and um, and his brother, Moritz. And he actually went to live, I think, with 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 um, Moritz after his wife died. So I think he was living in the same house in Berlin. I think, oh no, in Breslau that would have been, which is now a Rotslov, with, um, with Moritz and Martha and Arthur Korn. Um, he mentions going to Arthur Korn's father's wedding to Martha, and he mentions the birth of Arthur around 1890, though he doesn't really give any description of Arthur. Um, and I suppose it's notable that Arthur Korn and also my grandfather and great-grandfather eventually ended up coming to the UK in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. um, there's some mention... Daniel, sorry, if I can just interrupt there, I mean, I'm... Hmm always interested in the details of how somebody came to be able to come to the UK. Do you have any detail, either of you, in fact, as to the circumstances under which it was possible for them for to come to this country? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure that Arthur Korn, perhaps, was he helped by people within the sort of Baha'u movement? I'm sure there's some mention of some ref, some people who had already come over within that movement to London. Sorry, within which which, which movement? The, the Baha'u. Uh, Arthur Korn had to have reference letters and to have offer of uh, firstly reference letters, which he didn't mm. in 34, but obtained by 37, which mm. is how uh, Gropius stayed. He stayed because he started working with Max for yeah. Arthur couldn't do that or, for, some, for some reason. Uh, so he did need the letters. And I think the system was pretty much the same, similar to what it is now. You have to have somebody guarantee for you, or vouch for you mm. financially, and mm -hmm. balance off yeah. your job and so on. But do, do you know how others came, um, how Irma came to stay or how? 
Yeah, I don't know how am I? I mean, I don't know. I know about my own, the other side, like I say, yeah. the different stream of the family. I think, I'm I mean, the only reason I think my grandfather came was because he had a medical qualification. He did have to retrain mm -hmm. whilst he was here to be able to work in the UK, but it wasn't a sort of philanthropic thing. It was, it was because of his qualifications. And I think because of that, they didn't, um, because he, he was useful in that respect, they didn't send him to the Isle of Man like they did to uh, with um, Arthur Corn. Mm -hmm. He continued his practice in Leicester. His wife was also a, a doctor, but she didn't um, do think she practiced in the UK. So, um, so I think it was by virtue of that that they came. Um, and then I think by the fact that they were there, it was after Kristallnacht that my great grandfather eventually managed to, to come to the UK. Um, I wonder if I might bring in Irena Murray. I think Irena might, right, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you've done some interesting work on the experience and reception of the Czech uh, architects in this country. I mean, I was under the impression, I might be wrong, that actually in the field of architecture, you had to be, uh, you had to have the guarantee of being taken on by an existing British-based architectural practice. And if that's the case, I wonder indeed how Arthur actually managed to, to get here. But maybe, maybe, I'm, maybe that's not quite the whole truth. Even if you'd like to un unmute yourself, let me highlight you so people can see you. Irina, sorry, you're, you're still muted? Okay, okay. Yeah, now, now I'm unmuted. No, um, I think that we are talking about slightly about two different things. The um, uh, Arthur Korn came to Britain relatively early uh, before the existence uh, uh, before the birth of the RIBA Committee for Refugees, which only started its work in January 1939. So his contacts and the way that he uh, gradually integrated himself in the system, even though he was on the RIBA list eventually, might have been slightly different. And the fact that Maxwell Fry was one of the contacts and that uh, uh, Iris York was another one uh, would indicate that these might have been either contacts through, if not the Mars group, then uh, than one of the other groups that existed in Britain before the outbreak of the war. Thank you, Irena. I'm aware of time now rushing past. I suspect the stomachs yeah. are beginning to rumble. And I do have two questions, if I could perhaps turn to those. Um, first of all, yes, just thanks from John Goodman, who had to leave early, but uh, talked about a superbly rich presentation, I quote yeah. uh, Alexandra. So thank you for that, John. Um, and um, where should we start? There's a very general question from Anna and a very specific one from John Escombe. So perhaps we should start with John Escombe, who's uh, also done some work, I think, um, right, John, on on um, corn in the past. So what do people know of corn's only building in London, the flats at Letsom Street in Camberwell, circa 1933? Ah, that's early, must have been a little bit later than that, no? Vaguely reminiscent of his Königin Bayern office in, the, in, in Berlin, 1929, seems in a terrible state, and largely forgotten. Any information about this? Is that a building you've in fact encountered? Anybody in the audience, if not Alexandra? Hmm, interesting. John, would you like to, sorry again, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but to, given that you have worked on um, on corn, John, I wonder if you'd like to unmute yourself and say a few words? Uh, well, only only was really in, in, in terms of trying to investigate a bit more about this particular building. Um, I've been down there and it, it, I think it was originally built for the, what was then the Metropolitan Borough of Camberwell, which is now Southwark Council, um, and I think is now part um, third party council contracted out social housing with some private rentals inside, some of which seem to be quite swanky, but the external appearance seems to be in a terrible state. And it has this, I notice in quite a few of Corn's, the, uh, blocks of flats he built, mainly in Berlin, that he had this kind of interest in a kind of central column uh, where which projected out and and um, uh, areas of, of glazing either side of that. And he seems to have kind of copied this in this uh, rather sad now looking um, Letson Street development. 
Um, I, I don't know quite what the state of it is at the moment. I went down there a few years ago um, and I did read somewhere that the, there was a tenants association building at the end of that street, which was about to be pulled down and redevelop, redeveloped. So I just wonder whether it was actually at risk and whether, whether this building was particularly at risk, seeing as that bit is going to be demolished. I don't think that is actually Corn's work, the Tenants Association, but I just wonder whether there were plans, anybody knew, knew of any plans in that area to further redevelop. Um, but uh, maybe that's a question for the 20th Century Society. I was going to say, have you been in touch, John, with the 20th Century Society? I'm sure they'd prick up their ears if they don't already know yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, I mean, not for a while. I, um, uh, I have some correspondence from a while ago when I did actually visit it, and nothing seemed to be at, under threat mm. then. But this Tenants Association development thing seems to be fairly new. Um, but um, it, it just it seems to me that nobody seems to know anything much about this building. Mm. Much work still to be done, quite clearly. Um, I wonder if I might now turn to Anna Nyberg's question. It's a much more general one and possibly hard. Well, yes, it can be answered in broad terms. Really a question about um, early town planning. Um, was it more advanced in Germany than in England? And I was interested just on the back of that. You did mention Raymond Unwin as being a pioneering figure in that field, but he was a Brit, wasn't he? So maybe that rather counters the tendency we all have in this country to make the assumption, the generalisation that British culture, British visual culture was rather more backward and less international than anything going on in the continent. And I just wonder if you'd like to comment on that at all, Alexandra. Uh, well, yes, uh, in a bit. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure John will probably know and others will know better than I do, but um, it was different. It was simply different. In the continental architects built um, built parallel blocks and built a kind of radiant cities and London was built differently and uh, the infrastructure especially you can see in the plan that uh, that Korn proposed Korn and, um, and, and Samuel later proposed um, uh, was based around segments of town and uh, uh, kind of built upon the transport system the transport system in London was <laughs> and in Britain in general, is very different. So uh, it would not have been the same. I, I don't think it's possible to say that it was more advanced in Germany than in England. It was just different. Mm -hmm. The way that the, 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 the community spread, the way that it sort of um, sprawled, uh, London especially, but also other towns, the way it sprawled across and the, the way that the buildings were not a high rise buildings, but uh, you know uh, lines of what they said, uh, mean little houses. It was just a different way of living. It was a different way of uh, an, an enclosed communities and so on and so forth. It was different than the city centers in, in, in Germany or Paris or, or Vienna or, and, and there was that difference. But I think it was infrastructure, sorry. Anna, would you like to? <laughs> Sorry, yes, it's breaking yeah. up there. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's it's interesting. So it's obviously a huge, huge subject. But I just want, I couldn't resist saying that I really share your enthusiasm for the From <laughs> book. <laughs> Absolutely mm. wonderful social history, to which you have now added a design element that I didn't know was involved. But uh, I've just finished reading it by chance. So <laughs> I was absolutely delighted to hear about the factory. It was an incredible history. I absolutely did not know until until started reading because I I knew of Fromm's rubber factory and I assumed it was making like mechanical you know rubber for whatever and it was just I I like the, the the way that in a book they sort of make parallels between the translucent material and the way it might have inspired um, you know Cohen's use of glass or at least the way he wrote and thought. About yeah, it. interesting. It's just it's just Thank Thanks, Anna. Um, a word or a question about his internment experience. Interesting that he was, was he among the very first so-called enemy aliens to be interned? I, it rather sounds like it, doesn't it, in 1939, not in the spring, early summer of 1940? Yes, as a, as a arch left wing, but you have vehement Marxist, presumably he was one of the first. And I wonder how much you know about his time in Hutchinson. Alexa? Well, uh, I, 
Uh, no, I don't. I don't you, think. You don't, okay, I'm really. going to put you in touch. There's a wonderful book um, uh, by someone called Simon Parkin, and indeed Simon has given at least one talk for Insiders Outsiders, and I can send you and indeed tell other people about uh, about uh, or give you access to the recording. He's written a wonderful book which actually won a prize just recently and has been much acclaimed called The Island of Extraordinary Captives, which mm -hmm. is a wonderful read. I, I recommend it to everybody here, but it actually focuses specifically on Hutchinson and. Uh, Above all, perhaps for your purposes, he's actually compiled a, a proper roll call of exactly who was in the camp during that shameful internment episode. So I think he might have some interesting things to you know, sort of. Yes, especially on, on, so on that front. yes, you probably um, would have drafted that. Yes, yeah. Um, just wanted to mention what what John Eskom was saying about the uh, the, the flats in Camberwell. Um, I know that we know that Korn visited in 1930 and then visited in 1934, and he was briefly working. He would have had to be in practice with somebody else to build. So I'm not sure if, if John might know who was he in practice with, so who he would be building with. And also in that book, Planning and Architecture, that was given to Korn in 67, like, you know, the, uh, um, the essays and so on, it lists all his buildings, but that is not, I mean, I guess residential flats and commissions probably would not be listed so easily, but in chronology of his designs, um, it's not listed. So I'd be very curious to know, um, because it, it, in uh, 34, he came in, to England, didn't build anything, went to Yugoslavia and stayed there till 37. So when were these flats in Camberwell built and who in practice with would be, would be fantastic to know. Well, I, I, the dates are a little bit vague. I think it's between 33 and 38. Mm, okay. um, and I think it was with um, Francis York. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, now, it, it, there are some images of it in construction on Reba Picks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's photographed by Sidney Newbury. And so, that, I mean, so that it, 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 you can see the construction of it, which is all very interesting. But mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, the kind of uh, the trail ends there at the moment. So it's um, I, I can only think it was a uh, this um, Metropolitan Borough of Camberwell Commission, mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of early um, social housing kind of pre-war attempt. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, um, as I say, kind of unknown really. Oh, it would be great. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you for the for the clue. I'll I'll try. Okay. And... <laughs> well, I'm going to keep looking out for stuff on it uh, as well. I'll put the two of you in direct touch with each other for the conversation <laughs> to continue. Okay. I was quite intrigued by the collaboration with Felix Samueli. I think I'm right. He was the p person behind the Skylon at the Festival of Britain. Am I right? I, I think so. And I just wondered, did Arthur Corn get roped in in any way to the Festival of Britain, or was he deemed too left wing for his own good for that purpose? Um, I, I don't have any record of him. No, no. Yeah, um, a festival in Britain at all. I'm, um, and it could be because, well, he's a, he's a creative, and you know, the Samuel was predominantly a structural engineer, and the way he was, he was uh, involved in many um, engineering consultancies. Um, so he was, he had, uh, he worked with Chermayev on the Lavier uh, War Pavilion. I am not. Um, sure what else he might have done with corn at the time, but I know that he was very committed um, that his contribution um, was um, on in, in Mars pro plan was uh, was the engineering part and the, the consultancy on, on, on engineering and so on. So um, they probably have a, a, they sh there would have been correspondence of some sort. Mm. I haven't managed to find anything and at, at Architecture Association. Uh, database, but then again, when I looked the first time, the AA um, archive was at the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, and then they moved again, and then they had. I haven't really been able to find anything. Um, it would be good to know if uh, if they sort of at least made some plans to develop some other buildings, or or, or sort of if Mars Group was a springboard for something else other than you know other than the uh, just the plan for London. There must have been. Uh, more plan, more things in the plan, or, or at least theoretical works written. Mm. But I couldn't find any record of that. Fascinating, so much still to be discovered. Um, okay, uh, Penny Lawton, uh, just been on Street View, the Camberwell building with its central, ah, the central projecting bay seen on the Reba 
picture still survives. Okay, to be continued back clearly. Thank you, Penny. Uh, I think probably last chance given the time of evening for anybody else to either comment or ask a, a question. I don't know, Irena, whether you wanted to say anything more? Um, no, I think this was a wonderful, wonderful talk. And... Good, sadly, uh, Valeria Carulli. Well, I just throw in then, Monica, just yes, there's the book come. about the Hutchinson camp and Corn. I'm just looking at Corn is in there. Oh, he's, he, he has mentioned he, well, he would be. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And also, apropos the Festival of Britain, uh, Harriet Atkinson has, in fact, contributed a chapter for the Insiders Outsiders book um, mm -hmm. on the Festival of Britain and the kind of disproportionate number of erstwhile refugees, most of them Jewish, not all, um, who indeed contributed to that landmark, you know, British cultural event having been interned, you know, behind barbed wire not that many years earlier. So there are many ironies, but you might like to be in touch with her and I'm very happy to put you, put you in touch. Very good. So I think that's probably enough for one evening. Thank you very much indeed, Alexandra and Daniel. I'm very glad you can join us. And John, likewise, Irena, likewise. Um, the event has been recorded. It's been recorded onto the cloud because I had a technical issue with recording it onto my home computer, but I don't suppose that's an insurmountable technical problem. So it should be uploaded onto the Insiders Outsiders YouTube channel fairly soon. And take a look, those of you who don't know the YouTube channel, it's, uh, I say it myself, a rich resource of recordings of events on all sorts of interconnected topics, Festival of Britain, internment, there are quite a few uh, uh, events on various aspects of internment, and indeed architecture, Irena, I recognise from a lovely event she took part on, uh, in with, in fact, mm -hmm. Valeria Carullo on the artists, the architects refugee committee, and indeed particularly the Czech architects some while ago, so that's also on, on uh, our YouTube channel. And if those of you who don't know about the project more generally, if you just go to the Insiders Outsiders Festival.org website, you can sign up to the newsletter to find out about forthcoming events uh, in the future. There are all sorts of things kind of bubbling away for the longer term. Um, at the bottom, it's the bottom right of the homepage is where you can uh, do that. Good. So thank you, audience, as well. And uh, I look forward perhaps to seeing you at future events. And once more, thanks to our, our speakers. Okay. All the best. Thank you, thank you so much, Monica. Good night. Bye.